Good morning, everyone. We are gathered here today to remember and honor Michelle Langmead, daughter of Harriet and Al Burak, wife of Andrew, mother to Sam and Abby, a loving sister, sister-in-law, aunt, and a teacher and friend to so many of us here. Michelle believed that every major event in life was an opportunity to educate people. And so 
over the course of this service, I'm going to go into a little more detail than I otherwise might about what we're doing and why. Um, so just for starters, uh, it's traditional for Jews to be buried in a plain wooden coffin. And this is for a couple of reasons. One is that in the Talmud, uh, we're told that death should make everyone equal. Um, and so if everyone is in the same plain wooden coffin, um, there is no distinction between rich and poor. When someone leaves us, it's a heartbreak, no matter what. And the other reason is that um, uh, when the first human was formed, uh, Adam uh, was made out of the Adama, out of the earth. And therefore, we go back into the earth when, um, when we die, when we are done with our time on earth. And so a plain wooden coffin allows our bodies to return to the earth more naturally and continue the circle of life. Um, and coffins are closed at a Jewish funeral usually because um, this is a point at which the person is vulnerable and can't look back at us when we look at them. And so we give them a measure of privacy, even as we gather together to say goodbye and talk about who Michelle was to us and, and how much we're all going to miss her. So we'll begin with um, uh, Psalm 23, which is uh, in the leaflets that were handed out. Um, and this is a psalm that's traditionally said at funerals as, um, as a way to reassure us that, uh, that even though things are um, in turmoil right now, that they will not always feel this way and that um, our Creator has us in their hands. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of the righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we will first have some words from different members of Michelle's family, um, and then I will offer a few words and then I will call up um, Rabbi Josh Schreiber to offer the prayer for the dead, the El Male Rachamim. Um, and then we will offer words of comfort to those who are grieving. So I'm going to first ask Michelle's husband, Andrew, to come and speak. I mean, what is eulogy supposed to be anyway? I mean, some are to describe a slice of life that we can all communally recognize. I mean, some eulogies speak to how the speaker to see how the frame how the deceased should be remembered. I mean, some are a call to action. I mean, is it a way for the grief to have some final time to say what out loud loving thoughts that unsaid? Maybe in all of it. It's all of this and more, maybe something greater than anybody can imagine. When I met Michelle, we were just going to hang out over the summer. We both had different schools, an hour or so in each direction. Um, we were together 40 years. I mean, from the three months we planned to the 40 years, every day after that first summer, it was just a wonderful gift. I mean, at first we never gave much thought to, is this a serious relationship? We were just 
together all the time, putting each other first, and eventually looking back and like, oh, wait, this is for a lifetime. <laughs> or maybe we should do all along and just waiting for me to realize. Over the 40 years, we developed I mean, quite a repertoire of like running jokes, common stories that we could sum up in a couple of words and say to each other um, um, over everybody's heads. Um, catchphrases that one of us would say and the other one had an expected response to it. And no one is going to be here to catch those remarks now. I'm going to say something and know what Michelle's response should be, but it's just going to hang there unsaid. But some of my children, I got to understand, I mean, they grew up hearing them as normal goings on in our household and we'll spend a lifetime trying to untangle what's normal social common interactions and what are these weird quirks that their parents had. <laughs> um, you know, into normal households, I mean, do double blind taste tests a bottle of water? I mean, do they cut, cape, cut, cut cupcakes into quarters so that you can all taste the same flavor and compare them? I mean, sometimes I text my kids late at night and say, oh wait, no one else calls it shaky cheese. If you ask for that, no one's going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Michelle was at the synagogue all her life. I mean, she was, at one point, the young children who were running the hallways and screaming um, until shushed, told to shush and slow down. She was once the teens trying to find a quiet corner who were both annoyed at the loud children and the scolding adults. Um, she was the college kid being you know, home for the holidays and being dragged into high holiday services by her parents. She was um, the young parents bring, you know, looking for a place to give their child a strong Jewish identity outside of the home. Um, she was you know, one of the people sitting in a congregational meeting um, thinking to someone, shut up, you've made your point five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and she was a quiet, empty, empty nester, you know, sitting at, at Kiddush after services, you know, politely chatting with people. And now here she is, at the casket in front of us. Um, Michelle often wanted to teach and reuse examples in her life when her, you know, um, when the kids were being born, I mean, she'd be teaching about baby naming. When the kids were being bar mitzvah age, she'd use what was going in our household as an, incorporate that into her lessons. Um, and even in death, she wanted the rabbi to somehow have her death be a learning experience. When we bought our house a couple of decades ago, we never considered the mobility issues of needing to climb half a flight of stairs to get in and out of a split ranch. Michelle, I mean, eventually expected to retire to Florida, which was kind of a surprise to me. I mean, at what point we started talking about when we'd have marriage, when we'd have kids, and there were then assumptions we eventually had of where we'd go after that. Um, she expected to move to Florida as she'd seen her grandparents and great uncles and older cousins do, and I just expected to stay in New England for the rest of my life. And unfortunately, Michelle never got her home in Celebration, Florida. The end kept speeding up. I mean, each, each time we planned for a time frame and figured out how we could deal with it, that time frame shrunk. Um, we'd plan on how to handle the remaining years. And then the doctor would say he wasn't sure she'd be mobile enough for a vacation at the end of August. We'd buy dresses for graduation, then be not sure how we could get her there. And we'd put chairlifts to accommodate the stairs, and then she'd only use them twice. One time to go from the hospital um, to her home last time, and one time to leave from the home to her last day at the hospital. Um, by the time the synagogue started to work out how to transition school for next year, we're starting to miss days this year. Um, Family vacations then turned to figure out what we could do with the spring, which then turned to get here as quick as you can. Michelle was uncomfortable with people who had a very firm, concrete ideas of life after death, especially when that imagery depicted, I mean, life continuing kind of like this one, but with like clouds at your feet. 
Um, well, I'd say that, I mean, there's only, there's no way that we can know for sure, and the only thing we can do is have impacts on people's lives, and that is some metaphorical life after death. I mean, Michelle, on the other hand, would counter that, I mean, there might be something. I mean, I mean, some energy or essence that has to go somewhere. I mean, existence is something larger than what we can comprehend, and maybe all these interpretations form some form of the truth. Um, I mean, there'll be a few people talking. Um, I mean, the image that may, they make of Michelle will all be will all be a form of the truth, but they'll all be different. I mean, who she was in life was far greater than any one person is going to be able to express, and any one person's interpretation. I mean, greater than anybody can imagine. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm going to call up uh, Michelle's children, first Sam and then Abby. I want to start by saying that I've written and rewritten this multiple times over the past couple of days. To be honest, I'll be honest, I had an idea of how this was going to work. A lot of times when I'm submitting some kind of writing, when it's something I've never done before, I would send it to my mom to have her look it over, give notes, and then I would send it in. A lot of times when I was doing anything I've never done before, I would ask my mom, even if it was something that I could eventually figure out myself. Sometimes I would get a, you can figure it out response, either because she was busy or because she truly believed in my own capabilities. But other times she would completely walk me through it back to the basics so I could be prepared. And I would remind myself that I'm actually not the first person who, in the world who is going through this life. So here's how it would go. I would have this idea, I had this idea that she would want me to read her what I would say in the eulogy. I would say, well, how would you know that I was even going to follow through with saying that? I could completely change it without you knowing, uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to rewrite it. I would read it, she would give notes, and then I would read the final copy to all of you. But you all are getting the rough draft. But I think that's good, because what I'm saying today comes from a moment of realization that I don't know if I could have had at another time. As the daughter of a chronically ill mother who ended so many conversations with, well, you know, Sam, I'm not gonna be here forever, and as someone with anxiety in general, I had this idea in my head that I could prepare myself for the moments that grief would hit, and that would somehow make it all easier. My therapist called that trying to take control of an uncontrollable situation, and that technically that's part of the, of the denial phase of grief. And I told her that if she's going to put it that way, then I take it all back. I know that she's my therapist, but I didn't mean to play right into all of that. And I don't think that that helped my case. Um, but anyway, I tried, and again tried, because we all know it's impossible, to prepare myself for the moments that grief would hit me. The big moments, knowing that there would be major life events that she would miss. The little things, like asking questions that I really could have Googled, but, or asked anybody else, but was really using it as a conversation starter. The mundane things, like having to put my dad as my emergency contact on forms instead of my mom and the truly, truly unimportant things like having to sign up for a rewards program under my own phone number. <laughs> but what I wasn't prepared for was having to tell people. When I had to text one of my closest friends who my mom absolutely adored and had to tell her that I didn't even get a chance to say, do you want to come see her one last time? Because everything happened too fast to ask her to come over. When the messages started flooding in from everybody telling stories about how much they loved my mom, I already knew this, but it solidified in my mind and heart how many people's lives she touched, and obviously, look around, we can see it in real time. While some parents may have been annoyed at being the house that people always came to, my mom welcomed it. Whether it was for just an afternoon, just one night, a weekend, a week, or longer, she wanted to be the place where people felt they could stay. She wanted our house to be a safe place for people if they needed somewhere to go. And because of that, my weekends in high school were full of sleepovers. Everyone in the high school drama department knew my mom from hosting cast parties. But really, in short, if you knew me, you knew my mom. And as I tell my friends in New York, you may not have met my mom in person, but you have met her through my passion for cooking, and my passion for cooking for others, the way I try to build a community in the workplace, 
and my creative ways to solve any problems that come my way. In the past couple of days, Abby and I have asked people to share stories of my mom, and I've loved to see how many of my friends were impacted by her kindness. People who were in my life for years and knew my entire family, or for a short time and only met my mom through brief conversations. I think at the core of it all, while yes, she was Abby's and my mom, she was more than that. She became a maternal figure to anyone who needed one, or anyone who already had one and maybe just needed a little more. And because of her passing, we are all losing a bit of that. Thank you. And now, Michelle's younger child, Abby. I think we'd be doing a huge disservice if we didn't talk about food uh, when talking about my mother, at least for a little bit. So that's what I'm going to be doing a bit here. So many of you have had meals made by my mother, and some of you, like me, were lucky enough to cook with her. Most of the time when I would call her on the phone, I'd tell her what I was actively cooking or tell her what ingredients I have in my fridge and ask her what I should throw together. She always had an answer, even when she was hardly eating herself. Sometimes the answer was some recipe she used to make me when I was a kid when I'd completely forgotten about. Sometimes the answer was, you should come home and take whatever you want from the freezer. More often than not, when I told her what was in my fridge, she'd tell me, you need to go grocery shopping. <laughs> so on that point, I want to tell you this one stupid story about grocery shopping, but I promise I have a point. It just takes me a little second to get there. A few months ago, when she was in the hospital and I was living about an hour away in Brookline, I had got in my head that I was going to make risotto. I didn't have her massive red Lake Cuisette or any bottles of wine for my dad's collection, but I had a pan from Target, some homemade veggie stock that she had taught me how to make, and half an empty box of white wine, so I was determined to make do. I had gotten all my ingredients except for the rice. I could only find long grain wherever I went, and I checked three different supermarkets. And as I was unpacking all my groceries, I called my mom and told her, about my failed hunt. She reminds me that I'm looking for a Boreo rice, and I said, I know, I can't find it anywhere. It's the one with the red top, the little cube container. I know, but none of the stores near me had it. Two days later, she texts me that I should check the lobby of my apartment for a package. I go down, find the package, call her as I'm bringing it up, and open it. She picks up the phone, and I take out a container of this rice with the red top, the same brand that she would always get, and proceed to start laughing and thanking her profusely. I made risotto that night, the first time that my, mom, uh, my roommate had ever had it, and got to talking about my mom and the effort she put in after an offhand complaint on a phone call. <laughs> And I think the reason why I'm thinking about that now is because that's the way that my mom showed her love. It wasn't always the type of love that I was able to understand, but it was love that I lived with and experienced every single day. She was listening to what I said, and when she had the opportunity to solve a problem, she did with no complaining or expectations of praise. I also think that this is the type of love that most of you have experienced from my mother firsthand over the years. It's the quiet type of love that shows up in unexpected places. It's the moments that make your day when you didn't even realize that your day needed to be made in the first place. It comes through gifts, through times, through affirmation, and more often than not, yes, through food. And I think that I'm just left with this profound gratitude that I'm not alone in this experience of how much love my mom gave to the people around her. I hope that when you all think about my mom, you think about the quiet ways that she was telling you how much she loved you. And think about how many people here are thinking about the very same things that she did for them and just the sheer amount of love that she had to give. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Michelle's mother, Harriet, followed by Michelle's friend, Patty. Before I share my remarks, I just want to explain to you about a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> I have on two pins. One is a frog, and one is a cardinal. When Michael died, I decided that a frog was going to be my sign for Michael. Michael never stayed in one place very long, and frogs don't. So whenever I see a frog, I think of Michael. Michael's with me here on this pin. When Stacy died, 
She said one of her signs would be a cardinal. Whenever I see a cardinal, I think of her. Stacy's with me on my cardinal pin. Michelle is with me in spirit because I wasn't able to find what her sign is. Michelle told me before she passed that a chicken was going to be her sign. <laughs> I haven't seen a chicken pin, but if anybody does, I'm looking for one. The other thing I want to tell you before I begin is that after we return from the burial, we're going to be going into the social hall. The social hall has tablecloths on the tables, and they're bright pink and apple green. Not necessarily the somber colors you may be accustomed to seeing at a funeral. We recently had a sanctuary dedication here at the temple, and Michelle chose the colors of the cloths. What better tribute could I give my daughter than to celebrate her life with the cloths that she had chosen and the food she loved to make? And you've heard from Abby that she certainly did love to cook. The frittata that she served here was very commonplace. We're having that today. The cinnamon babka from Cheryl Ann's was one of her favorites. And Michelle loved making roasted vegetables. We're having those too. So Michelle, this is for you. As I was preparing to write these wor words, I came across the eulogy that Michelle wrote and gave when her father passed. As I read her words, it reinforced something I always knew. Michelle was so much like her father in so many ways, really good ways. Now, Michelle did look like her father. In fact, when she was a baby, my mother-in-law would look at her and say, one face. She really was a beautiful baby with her round face, dark hair, and hazel eyes. Michelle described her father as caring. That was Michelle. Michelle was devoted to her children and there for them whenever they needed her. Her husband, Andrew, and she were a unit, each supporting the other. When Michelle and Andrew married in 1992, Michelle gained another family, a wonderful one. She loved Andrew's parents and gained so many brothers and sisters. She was so fortunate. And I was so fortunate. She was the daughter I could always count on. She was always there to listen and to try to help to solve a problem. After my daughter Stacy passed, Michelle told me that she wanted to travel with me for my birthday each year to places we had never gone and make new memories. I will never forget the amazing road trip we took to Cape May in New Jersey with Michelle at the wheel. Another time, Michelle knew I love flowers and planned a trip to the wicked tulip farm in Rhode Island when the flowers were in full bloom. Last summer, Michelle and I flew to North Carolina because Michelle knew I had a close friend there and that I wanted to see her. It wasn't easy for Michelle as her disease was progressing and she was using a walker, but she insisted on going and I was blessed to have her with me. My amazing daughter opened her home to a young woman from Ukraine who became a part of Michelle's extended family. Recently, she and Andrew opened their home to their niece, who came to live with them. Michelle found joy in teaching her niece to cook and having her part of the household. Michelle adopted chickens and referred to them as the girls. <laughs> These chickens were treated to all kinds of special food, watermelons, all kinds of veggies. I don't think there's a chicken around that lived the lives that her chickens lived. She loved to sit by their pen and talk to them. Michelle cared about her temple community, and Temple Beth Abraham, now B'nai Tikva, became her home away from home. Michelle loved teaching and adored her students. About 10 years ago, she was diagnosed with multiple autoimmune diseases. That did not stop her. Michelle continued to do what she loved to do, being here at the temple. As principal of the Hebrew school, she created some innovative programs that really made a difference. And when Temple Beth Abraham merged with Temple Beth Am of Randolph, Michelle was welcomed into our new merged community. Her friendship circle widened because that's who she was. Michelle and said her dad loved to cook. Michelle learned from the best. 
I'm no slouch in the kitchen, but Michelle was way above me. And her barbecue was fabulous. Both of Michelle's children have inherited her love of cooking. She taught them well. Michelle's hospitality was seen here many Saturdays at Kiddish. Michelle often volunteered her skills for sisterhood. Barbecues for her Temple family were an event that she loved to plan. She created a menu, shopped and cooked. Michelle was so generous with her time and so willing to help anyone when there was a need. So generous and giving best describes my daughter. We often worked together on Temple events. We traveled together. We shared amazing times together and I truly valued her opinion. She was so knowledgeable in so many ways. Respect. Michelle was taught by her dad to do what she believed was right, to stand up for what she believed in, and she always did. I knew that I could always count on my daughter for a fair opinion, and I often consulted with her. Michelle had an incredible relationship with her papa, my father, who lived to see her get married to Andrew. They would share ideas, thoughts, philosophies. Michelle always respected her papa so much. Michelle had the gift of gab. She could talk about anything with anyone, and she often did. On bus trips we took together, she made many new friends. Our trip to Cuba with Rabbi Nava Levine when we were Beth Abraham proved that point. Michelle learned so much about the Cuban culture by asking questions. My baby Michelle was born in 1966, and I was a very young mother. By the time I was 25, I had three children. Michelle was an easy baby, and that was a good thing, because I didn't know a whole lot about babies when I first had her. In nursery school, Michelle's teacher told me that Michelle was the nicest, kindest child she'd ever had. When Michelle was in the fourth grade, we moved from one school district to another. We were still in Canton, but Michelle was in a different school. Now this is the part that departs a little. I'm telling you all these wonderful things about Michelle, but Michelle knew how to push my buttons. She knew how to tease me, and she did it often. We stayed in Canton, but she was in a different school. She told me, and told me often, that I had traumatized her, and that she would never forgive me for that. You see, she went to Hemingway through the fourth grade. Then she went to the Kennedy for the fifth. That was her last year in elementary school, and she spent it in the new school where she was the new kid. The next year, she went on to middle school and reunited with her friends. But she still never let me forget that in her words, I had traumatized her. Years later, she was still telling people that. What did I know? I guess I was a bad mother. I didn't know it at the time. Michelle was a wonderful big sister to her siblings, Stacy and Michael. Although Stacy would complain that Michelle and Michael often banded together and played pranks on her. I guess Michelle was good, but not that good. I was an only child, so I never knew about sibling rivalry or pranks. As children, they learned to share. My cousin Sumner bought them a Nintendo, and they were in heaven. They loved and they shared it as well as the many board games they had. Although they were competitive, they played nicely together. But one memory comes to mind where sharing wasn't all that great. We had planned a trip, a family trip, to Williamsburg, Virginia. And shortly before we left, Michael was exposed to the chicken pox. Now none of us, including Al and I, had ever had it. You guessed it. We were traveling in close quarters. Michelle kept announcing, Ma, he's breathing on me. <laughs> and I answered, if you get it, you get it. And we all did. We all returned home with pockmarks all over us. Michelle, Stacy, and Michael recovered quickly. Al and I took much longer. We never forgot that time in our lives. And again, I got blamed by Michelle for letting Michael give her the chicken pox. <laughs> Michelle, again, always knew how to push my buttons. Tragically, none of my children were destined to have lived long lives in years. But what they didn't have in time, they made up in the quality. 
Of their time here, I must celebrate their lives. I was blessed to be their mother. My daughter, Michelle, is a part of me. She will always be a part of me. Michelle, Stacy, and Michael are all a part of me. I think about them. I talk about them. I tell their stories. I remember them. And I am grateful for them every minute of every day. Michelle and Stacy always had a discussion that had no ending. Michelle would say to Stacy, I love you more. And Stacy would answer, no, I love you more. My love for Michelle cannot be quantified. I love you, my darling Michelle, more and more and more. Thank you for being here. And thank you for listening. I know this was a little lengthy, but it were things I needed to say. We'll now hear from Michelle's friend, Patty Caesar. Good morning. B'nai Tikva members and leadership, Rabbi, Michelle's colleagues, family, and friends, dearest Harriet, beautiful, talented Sam, brilliant Abby, and devoted Andrew. Oh, this is a sad day. It's for this place, it's sad for all our hearts, for my heart, because we're missing something. <clears throat> the loving, kind, talented, dedicated, energetic, generous, bright person. The person, the thread that connects us all together here at this moment. It's a sad day because Michelle's not here. But two things can be true at once. Because it's also a grateful day. It's a day to reflect and be thankful for all our sweet memories and experiences with her. Her achievements, her acts of kindness, the lessons she taught us. All of these created for us and with us by the only, one and only Michelle. I know we're all grateful for those things and more. I'm, th I'm thankful and honored for the opportunity to share with all of you a bit about my 20-year relationship with Michelle. We met when our children were in elementary school together. And since then, like all her friends, I've witnessed what she gave during her life to so many around her, her extended family, her beloved husband, children, mother, father, sister, and brother, and to this, her cherished temple. If you needed a place to stay, her, her door was open. If you needed somebody to talk to, her heart was open. And if you needed to fill your belly, her kitchen was certainly open. She would often say to me when I called her and I was in the area, are you hungry? Have you eaten? <laughs> and if you happen to have a massive wasp's nest in your front bushes, like I did years ago, my kids will remember this, her resourcefulness and her bravery were open and ready. Within the hour, she was at my house with a stick, gloves, and spray. Filled with energy, I would often say that Michelle did more by 10 a.m. than I did all day long. <laughs> and while Michelle was an incredible wife and mother, daughter, daughter-in-law, aunt, cousin, teacher, colleague, temple and community member, I'd like to share the kind of sister she was. And I think she would like that. Because Michelle was my sister. 
not by biology, but by choice. I would call her my Elsie. Elsie was my mom's best friend. They grazed their kids together and went on all kinds of escapades and adventures together. And Michelle and I had a lot of adventures too. In New York City, she would tell me where to get the best cheesecake and the best deli. She loved that my favorite was Kishki because Al's favorite was Kishki, or one of his favorites. We'd enjoy musicals, theater, local farms, restaurants, bakeries. And no matter where we went, whether it was in town or even out of state, we ran into someone who knew Michelle. <laughs> New Jersey or New York or Connecticut. We'd stop on the way to eat something, and she'd be like, oh, there's so-and-so. And they're like, oh. It was amazing. Now Michelle knew my mom, and when we told her that I called her my Elsie, she smiled and she said how lucky we were. Lucky, I feel lucky to have had Michelle as my friend and chosen sister, and I was hers. So this is a sad day because she's not on this planet with us anymore. And it's a grateful day for all the wonderful gifts that Michelle shared with us. At this moment, Michelle, I am grateful that you are free from physical pain and you can rest in peace with your dad and your brother and your sister, all of their memories of blessing. Andrew, Sam, Abby, Harriet, thank you for the honor of letting me speak today. And Michelle, my sweet, sweet friend and sister, my memories with you will be a blessing for the rest of my life. Thank you. Janice Korzak, a Jewish educator, once said, one who cares for days sows wheat. One who cares for years plants trees. One who cares for generations educates people. Michelle was a gifted and compassionate and passionate teacher. She grew up in the synagogue and began teaching here fresh out of college. I would say she was dedicated to te teaching children, but that's not quite accurate. She was dedicated to teaching each individual child. What knowledge did they already have? How did they learn best? How could she make them feel seen and safe so they would open up and flourish? She was ahead of her time. When she started, there really wasn't much public awareness of things like individualized learning plans or immersive sensory learning experiences, even in secular education. And those things were absolutely unheard of in a religious school setting. Michelle innovated our door to door program, generation to generation, pairing students with individual volunteers so each child could go at their own pace. She was always on the lookout for fun new activities and ways to get the kids excited about learning prayers, rituals, and stories. She talked to me more than once about wanting the kids to have a giant slumber party in the temple. <laughs> Why? Because if they got to explore the building when no one else was here, they would feel this was their place. She wanted each of them to feel ownership of their Judaism. Her other passion, cooking, is something she got from both her parents, but especially, as Harriet said, from her father, Al. As Harriet has said, Michelle took after Al in any number of ways, one of them being that no matter where she was, she'd end up talking to people around her and making friends with them, even if she was just online somewhere, like the post office. 
When Al took over cooking in the temple, making Shabbos morning kiddishes, uh, making spaghetti dinners on bingo night, Michelle would be right there beside him in the kitchen, helping feed people. And after he died, Michelle took over the kitchen with her usual enthusiasm and organizational skills. As we heard, Michelle especially loved combining her two passions, cooking and teaching. When she worked with kids at the JCC, she began teaching cooking skills to the kids who refused to nap during nap time. Um, this eventually led into her teaching culinary arts at Camp Westwoods in Stoughton for several summers. She taught people of all ages how to cook and bake, from elementary school kids to retirees, from her own children and their friends to virtual strangers, because she knew that making food is a way to care for ourselves and the people we love. It's a way to bond with friends, to be creative, to connect to our tradition. It nourishes our souls, not just our bodies. She developed other passions as well over the years. She and Andrew joked that being empty nesters gave them the freedom to become more weird, to try new things. So she filled her empty nest with chickens named after Jewish feminists like Gloria Steinem and Bella Abzug. She discovered a love for musical theater and loved going to shows with her mom, with her kids, with friends and family. She traveled, went on adventures with the people she loved. When I asked Sam and Abby what Michelle was like as a mom, Sam talked about traveling to the Grand Canyon with her mom, a mother-daughter trip that echoed one Michelle took with her own mother, Harriet, a few years before. They realized only in the middle of their travels that maybe they should have planned better because neither of them understood how big Arizona was. <laughs> but even though Michelle was on oxygen by that point, she did what she could. They had a wonderful adventure. And when she did have to turn back and rest at the hotel, Sam stayed to watch the sunset, texting minute by minute, less because Michelle was worried and more to reassure herself that her mom was nearby. And it was an adventure, and the photos and memories were more than worth it. Abby remembered that as, uh, as they said, when they came home from college, their favorite foods would be in the freezer. Michelle taught both her kids how to cook, and Abby's own love for making stuff and providing for their community can clearly trace back to their mom. They remember Michelle's teaching method as, I'm going to talk you through this thing you want to learn to cook while I watch MASH in the next room. <laughs> And a lot of us had a similar experience with Michelle. I'm going to talk you through this, but you're going to do it yourself and know you can do it yourself. But if you get stuck, I'm here. Some people who are social butterflies are all surface, with lots of acquaintances and casual friendships. Not Michelle. She had so many long-standing, deep relationships from her kids' friends to whom she was a second mom, to the students she mentored, friends she knew from every stage of life, and of course, the love of her life, Andrew. This past week, I asked Michelle and Andrew how they met, since I'd never heard the story before, and for the younger members in our audience, please pardon my French. Um, Michelle met Andrew at a party one summer while she was home from college. And she was in a bit of a sassy mood. And so she would go up to people saying, I'm Michelle, who the hell are you? <laughs> and Andrew rose to the challenge by responding, I'm Andrew, damn it. <laughs> Over the course of the evening, they kept circling back to each other at this party, just talking, enjoying each other's company. A few days later, they went to a group outing uh, to Rocky Point Amusement Park. And they went on one of the rides together. Uh, one of these tunnel of terror or tunnel of love things, sitting next to each other, their hands slowly drifting closer until they touched. They each thought this was just a fun person to hang out with, but by the end of the summer, they were inseparable, talking every night until Andrew's dad got the phone bill. <laughs> there was no lightning bolt revelation that this was the one. 
as they both described it, at a certain point, they both looked in the rearview mirror and realized they had been in love for a long time. They were true partners, backing each other up, supporting each other, building a home and a family, building the kind of in-jokes and shorthand, as Andrew said, that you only have with someone who knows you inside and out. That kind of love is a rare gift. Michelle thought she would have more time. As test results came back and treatments failed, she kept revising her timeline of which of the things she wanted to do was possible in the precious time she had left. And we kept revising our plans too. The teens she had mentored wanted to make a surprise party for her. And her cousin, Joe Doniger, arranged a special scholarship in her honor for the religious school. We didn't get the chance to show her just how much she meant to us. Earlier this week, I needed to explain to the kids and teens about Michelle's death and about death in general. I ended by telling them the difference between someone's memory being a blessing because it feels good to remember them and being for a blessing, meaning that when we compare someone to them, it's a huge compliment. Michelle was both. May her memory be a blessing and be for a blessing. I'm going to close my remarks with a quote from uh, the great 20th century writer and philosopher A.A. A. Milne. Um, this is from The House at Pooh Corner. Um, Michelle was a big Winnie the Pooh fan. And it's the end of the book when Christopher Robin is about to go away to school and has to say goodbye to his best friend. Pooh, when I'm, you know, when I'm not doing nothing, will you come up here sometimes? Just me? Yes, Pooh. Will you be here too? Yes, Pooh, I will be, really. I promise I will be, Pooh. That's good, said Pooh. Pooh, promise you won't forget about me, ever. Not even when I'm a hundred. Pooh thought for a little. How old shall I be then? Ninety-nine. Pooh nodded. I promise, he said. Michelle is going to be in our memories and in all the places where we have loved her. And whenever we go there, she will be there with us. I am going to invite up Rabbi Josh Schreiber for the El Male, which is the prayer that we say for those who we have lost asking God to protect and shelter them. את נשמת מה שסימה בת אברהם וחיה דינה שהלכה לעולמה בגן עדן תהיה מנוחתה אנא בעל הרחמים אסתיריה בסתח כנפיך לעולמים וצרור בצרור החיים את נשמתה ארנאי ונחלתה ותנוח בשלום על משכבה ונאמר אההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
I'm going to take a moment just to translate that prayer for us. Exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the soul of Michelle, who has gone to her eternal home. Merciful one, we ask that our loved one find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May her soul be bound up in the bond of life. May she rest in peace. And let us say, Amen. Amen. We'll remain standing as the pallbringer bearers bring the casket out. We'll remain in place as the family leaves. And it's customary to offer words of consolation to the family. The traditional phrase is, Hamakom Yinachem Etchem, Betoch Shar Ave Le Tzion Virushalayim. In English, may God comfort you among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. It's a reminder that even in this painful moment, you are not alone in your grief. After the burial, which will be at Sharon Memorial, there will be a meal of consolation here at the temple, and Shiva will be at the Langmead home today and tomorrow, and at Harriet Burek's home on Thursday, and the details are in your flyers. May you be comforted. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that if you're going to the cemetery, put your full headlights and flashes on and stay in your cars until you are instructed to move to the cemetery. We have many cars to move around. So if you came into the back, I suggest you go out the back door, back to the car, so it's not going to the cemetery. But if you're going to the cemetery, please do not move your car. Get in your car, put your motorcycle, and wait for our to Thank you. 